Welcome. On Capital Conversations, we bring you movers and shakers from our state legislature to talk about what's going on at the Capitol and how it affects us here in Longmont. Today, we have State Representative Jonathan Singer, elected from House District 11, which includes South Longmont. Representative Singer is also a candidate for Boulder County Commissioner in this fall's election. I'm Marcia Martin, and this is Capital Conversations. Representative Singer today is here to talk about the nexus of public health and human services with criminal justice at the state and local level. Representative Singer, can you please introduce this topic for us? I'll do my best, and thanks for having me here, too. I know we're, we're on a tape delay here, but it is Super Sunday, yes. and, and so I can't think of a topic more super than what is costing mm -hmm. our state, our county, and our local governments the most, and what we can do to fix it. So, um, you know, I tell people, you know, we're in the middle of an affordable housing crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the middle of a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that's in the middle of all of that is our criminal justice system. So uh, in Colorado and even in Boulder County, I tell people we do a great job of housing our, uh, our folks, feeding them, and taking care of their medical needs in the most expensive, least humane way. And that's through our jail and prison system. And so we have a chance really to be at a turning point where Democrats and Republicans and independents are actually working together to say, we can actually save our taxpayers money by actually investing in these services upfront uh, to be able to make sure that people have a safe place to live, access to medical care, mental health care, so they don't enter the criminal justice system or once they've exited the criminal justice system, they get those supports they need so they don't come back. Uh, I'd ru ru much rather spend $10,000 a year of taxpayer money on a whole bevy of people than $30,000 a year on just one person warehousing them. Well, actually, we think it's more than $30,000 a year, at least here in Longmont. So um, I'm with you on those objectives. Um, we have a hard time housing, a hard time here in Longmont with transitional housing. Hmm which is, uh, there, as you said, two ways for that to flow. There are people falling out of stable housing because they can't pay their rent or because they get in trouble or because they have a medical problem. And then we have people uh, coming out of the criminal justice system or the juvenile system and uh, not being able to find a place to stay. Uh, what are you doing to address the latter? So there's people coming out of the criminal justice system. Yes. So I think, you know, what's really exciting at the legislature, we actually have a bill right now that I've authored that has uh, bipartisan support and is focused on, on that issue of what's going on in our criminal justice system. So uh, right now we know that even in our Boulder County Jail, over half of the jail population is struggling with some sort of substance use disorder issue or mental health problem. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is once we've identified those things, is start to figure out ways to transition those folks. Now, the, the taxpayers in Boulder County have said that we're gonna focus on this locally through a transitional uh, a program through our jails. It's a good step in the right direction. I think we can do one better. Mm -hmm. and, and that's actually providing new grants for local nonprofits, city governments, and county governments to be able to implement their own transitional programs and build capacity for those things. And so the most exciting part about this bill for me um, mm -hmm. is really we're going to be focusing it on rural and frontier counties. That doesn't sound like Boulder. That doesn't sound... It doesn't. <laughs> right? But this is the thing, and, and people in Boulder know this, and this is where it gets back to transitional. Yeah. Um, Highly resourced counties such as Boulder or even Denver see a massive influx of people from other parts of the state because the resources to address these issues aren't there. Mm -hmm. And so people want to live in Wellington. They want to live in the communities they grew up in, whether it is in Paonia or whatever other part of the, or Sterling, whatever other part of the state they're in. And so what can we do as a state to say, okay, you do live in this really sparsely populated area. 
it's really hard for any community agency or city government to apply for grants because they're just keeping their heads above water with as, as little resources as they have. An infusion of anywhere between $10,000 and $100,000 could make all the difference in that community. Um, decrease the number of people coming to suburban and urban areas looking for help and actually allow people to live in the communities that they, they feel like they belong in. So that's, that's a part of it. The second part is to say, while we're prioritizing those dollars um, to rural and frontier communities, um, if there, there's a lack of interest or availability or ability to deal with it, let's bring those dollars into our local communities. And so there's a, a group here in Longmont uh, called the Reentry Project. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with it. They primarily work with women leaving the criminal justice system. And um, what they've done is very much what this bill will do. It creates a supportive housing system. And a lot of people, they hear the buzzword, but don't know, always know what it means. What this is, is it's saying, we're going to find ways to not only provide housing for you, but if you're struggling with mental health issues, if you're struggling with the fact that you've been in jail for 20 years and don't know how to use a cell phone, we're going to get you the fine-tuned case management services that you need to get yourself back on your feet. And then, once again, work in a transitional situation where we say, you have subsidized housing, you have a case manager, and as soon as, as, soon as we can, we're going to get, get you to a point where you don't need the, those services anymore. Basically turn you into a productive member of society, turn you into a taxpayer, some people like to say. And, um, but that looks different in different communities. In this community, I happen to know that we've got waiting lines for people to get into that kind of transitional program that you're talking about. Um, and we also have a problem with people who are in those transitional uh, situations that uh, are staying because they can't find a place to transition out of them. Uh, what is your program going to do about that? Because ultimately, um, the implementation part always does seem to fall on the municipalities. Uh, it falls on municipalities and counties um, or on local nonprofits to figure out the, the middle part of that. And in my opinion, actually, I think that's some of the best places to do it. If uh, bureaucrats in Denver are trying to figure out what works best in Longmont uh, and they're not living here, they're probably going to get it wrong more often than not. And so what we need to do is, is open up those streams of dollars for local community agencies, county and city governments to be able to figure these things out. Um, in a perfect world, you know, we would actually just have enough housing for the people that need it. And I actually think that's, that's a possibility that people haven't really thought of, that the housing is a basic human right. I have always thought so. Well, you know, I think the most of the rest of the country does. But if you look at what the Reagan administration did um, in the mm -hmm. 1980s, there was this massive cut into housing services, followed by a massive shift of people into our jails and prisons uh, across the country. So because we're of the uh, state hospitals, state mental hospitals, all being unfunded. Right? Well, it's deinstitutionalization, but it was mm -hmm. also literally tens of millions, if not billions of dollars that were cut from housing and urban development's budget. Mm -hmm. So you have less resources going into one place and that all of that shifted into another, which was our, our criminal justice system, if we want to use the word justice in this case. So um, so really, this is, this is a paradigm shift where we have to swing the pendulum back and say this is a basic right and the funds are available if we use it the right way. So what's the right way and what where are the funds going to come from under the program you're proposing? So um, there's a couple of grant programs actually in the state. There's a housing development grant program um, that was partially created through uh, our marijuana tax cash fund. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, um, we'll probably be looking at using the general fund if, if Tabor has any money left over. Uh, and, and so these are really tough conversations to have. 
Um, the other, the third thing is that we're going to use these grants to allow local governments and communities to build capacity. This is the grants from your bill that you're working on and that we're talking about. That's right correct. Now. Yeah. Does it have a n name yet? A number? Uh, it, you know, it has a bill number, and if I could remember any of my bill numbers, um, <laughs> I would say them. Uh, but you know, uh, around okay. around this place, what I just tell people is, you know, this is uh, Jonathan Singer's bill to focus on uh, transitioning our criminal justice system. Uh, into in, for housing services. Well, I so. read a bill like what you're describing, uh, and I don't remember its number either, but I did see that it had grants in it, which made me feel good until you said we're prioritizing cities that aren't in Longmont. Um, <laughs> So well, how do you get a piece of this pie? Well, so actually, so reentry initiative is already applied um, mm -hmm. because this builds off of a program that we helped start uh, several years ago, mm -hmm. and it's been building on itself in different ways. Uh, and, and so actually, um, the, the short answer is call my office and call the Department of Local Affairs. <laughs> we'll go through the Division of Housing, and those yeah. dollars are available now. Um, so they're available now they even are, though this bill is in process. The bill builds on, on existing an existing program and dollars that have never been fine-tuned for our rural communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have local area agency nonprofits okay. um, doing this. And, and this is so important. To, well, I'm sharing the message right now. Uh -huh. um, and this is the commu communications I've been having with our local nonprofits as well. These programs are out there. Sometimes we just need to know where to look. And so I'm, I'm putting up the red flag right now. Okay, so what, I mean, we beg DOLA on a regular basis, on an annual basis, uh -huh. I would say. Um, what new money comes from the bill that you're working on? So it's, it's right now, assuming it passes, it's a pocket of about $3 million. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so th those would be new dollars added on to uh, a grant program that already has actually several million dollars in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you can do uh, as a city council member, as a member of the community, is reach out to my office and we can talk to the Division of Housing and say, what's the dis disposition of those funds today? What's left over? And what's the next grant round? Um, and, you know, it's one of those challenges that as much as we can get our money out there, we need to make sure that the message is out there as well. But what's the um, money earmarked for? That is, is it for case managers? Is it to build housing? Is it to subsidize housing? What does it do? It, it's an all the above actually and so really it's it's a proposal that you would have to send I, I love talking about grant proposals on on Super <laughs> Sunday uh, so it, it's a grant proposal program where you would talk about how you would provide supportive housing yeah. for your population so this isn't just building new buildings it isn't just uh, providing vouchers or, or subsidizing other programs it's about doing that in a continuum where individual case management services are also provided. So if you want to do that through county services, if you wanted to do that through uh, area agency nonprofits, those we want to have a maximum flexibility with those dollars so we can fine tune this to those communities. So those, those are important questions and there's no one size fits all answer. So uh, the, the innovative thing about your bill then is what does it does it provide a more streamlined method of coordination or allocation or is it basically just a funding bill that that sequesters some money for these purposes well here, here's the most exciting part of this is it really it really does a handful of things one is it, it builds on a program that exists um, targets it to rural communities but it also says we need to collect data and research to see how many people are actually succeeding, how many people are returning back to our jails or back to our prisons. Uh, the more research that we can do with this, the more we can show uh, there's real savings. Uh, but preliminary research on these types of programs shows basically uh, anywhere between a 1 to 7 and 1 to 12 um, return on investment. So we're actually saving money while building people's lives back up. And the return on investment comes from what? Well, if you have someone who is leaving the criminal justice system, unfortunately, uh, so in some numbers say half those people go back. Um, right. And so if we're not housing people through our jails, spending 30000 dollars 50000 a year, yeah. um, we can be really saving money. Also, it takes into account things like payroll tax, income tax, 
property tax. When people become functioning members of society, they're literally contributing back to the base and, and building on a system where we can continue to grow and, and serve people better. So when you say they go back, there are two places that are back for them to go. Um, one is recidivism, where they get back into the criminal justice system. And the other one is homelessness, where they become free people but hmm. can't yeah. find a job or housing or any of those things. Um, we know that um, uh, in Longmont, a homeless person costs the city between thirty and $100,000 a year, depending on whether they're sick or well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so that certainly is a cost, but which, when you were calculating that cost, which kind of back were you talking about? Back into criminal justice or back into homelessness? Well, and yeah, I, you know, I say it's uh, people experiencing homelessness because hopefully mm -hmm. they, it's not, uh, hopefully people are, are not homeless for, for their entire lives. And so for, for those who are experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. really it can be the criminal justice system. You can go back into homelessness and you know what? Medicaid is footing the bill, and those are some of our highest utilizers of emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. Once again, our taxpayers are paying for that. So it may yes. not be, it may be the city, it's probably not the city if it's Medicaid, with the exception of maybe uh, a, a, law, a touch from law enforcement. But then, you know, one visit to the ER, that can easily be anywhere between one and $10,000. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, calculating, we're calculating costs to the state when I say that, mm -hmm. but it could be Medicaid costs, it could be uh, state prison costs, um, and it could it also, but there's also costs associated with county jails and obviously city services. So it, it runs the gamut, and mm -hmm. um, you know this is something interestingly enough that even uh, conservative Republicans go, look, I I don't believe in subsidizing people's housing, but I really don't believe in subsidizing people's housing in our jails and our prisons where you're limiting people's freedom even more. Um, and costing us even more. So we've we've found a way to thread that needle, mm -hmm. and it's okay. um, it's something that the more we describe this to people, you know, I say housing is a fundamental right. If I tell people on the on the right wing side, okay, you don't believe with me with this one issue, well, how do you feel about spending thirty to fifty thousand dollars of your money on these issues in another venue? I usually get a pretty resounding no. <laughs> Um, sometimes when I ask questions like that, it's just make them go away. Um, but that doesn't ever happen, of course. Oh, it goes away. It goes away into a place where, our, unfortunately, our sheriffs and our deputies are, are warehousing folks and, and creating almost a, you know, it's almost a boiler room or a situation where you're overcrowding our, our jails and prisons. Our Jefferson County Jail is now trying to figure out how to let people out of jail faster because they're so overcrowded. Well, interestingly, um, while trying to prepare for this interview, um, I, I asked uh, our deputy chief of police uh, about the situation, about the nexus between um, public housing and public services and law enforcement. And he said that he was very concerned about um, solving the problem by having few, by, by making it easier to get out of jail when you're not really ready to be on your own. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone has mental health issues that are unresolved and they don't have a support system that allows them to get access to mental health services. It is a problem for them to be out of jail. Yeah. Um, how do are you doing anything to address that to make that to make that process make more sense? Absolutely, and actually, I think our county has done a pretty good job of stepping up, and it's something we should work on expanding. You know, there is everything from being in jail to work release to actually making sure that we um, are working on supportive housing issues. Mm -hmm. um, so many people are le are getting stuck in this never-ending cycle of being released on parole or probation and then for minor infractions being sent right back and so what you do is you do upfront case management services mm -hmm. with people before they leave let's get you on Medicaid let's get you talking to a job counselor have you um, have you thought about what your plan is to stay um, stay clean and sober um, I'll give you one really important example actually um, 
people struggling with opioid illnesses mm -hmm. or opioid dependence, um, if you're in jail, it's much harder to access illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get out and those stressors start to hit, um, if you don't have an outlet and, you, and someone chooses to use again, the likelihood of overdose is greatly increased because the tolerance has gone down and now people are getting sick, they're overdosing and they're dying. And so making sure that we have the right transitional sources and resources, including medication and counseling at that front end is so critical. Um, I'll say one other thing, actually. Um, we're working on another bill just on, <laughs> on, just on the medical issue. Okay. So, well, I know that you have an opioid bill, but if, for me, the burning question is where are those case managers coming from? Because the, the way I have understood the problem is, is that people aren't being transitioned out of jail because the counties can't provide enough case managers. Well, uh, I mean, that's, that's arguably one of the worst reasons not to release people, well. um, but not <laughs> your fault. Um, and, and so what we're doing is, uh, I'll work backwards and say, we're working on a continuum of care right now. Uh -huh. And so I'll give you an example. I have another bill that's just looking at data. And um, so let's say I uh, have health insurance and there's a mental health issue that ends up lands me in jail. Um, I now lose my insurance and I'm on the jails program. Uh -huh. If that jail doesn't have access to my electronic health records, they might go, well, we don't know what's gonna, what's gonna best serve me struggling with anxiety or depression. You get put on the wrong medication and all of a sudden that exacerbates into an issue at the jail and all of a sudden they send me to prison. Well, in prison, if they don't have access to those electronic records in jail, wash, rinse, repeat. And so what we're working on is creating that continuum of care to make sure that um, people's records follow, them, uh, follow each other so we're providing the right services. And the other thing is there is not going to be a strong state program for this. There will be dollars, not enough, but there will be dollars that will be sent out to local communities for them to figure out how these resources are going to work best. Now, Longmont has a fairly strong program for doing the kind of work you're, you're talking about, although it's less transitioning people out of, of jail and prison and more uh, about keeping them out of, of the criminal justice system um, and getting them into uh, drug rehab systems. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I wanted to say this at one point when you um, uh, mentioned, well, maybe it's one touch from the, from the local municipal police force mm -hmm. um, because the transition programs that we provide have a lot of touches in them. Yeah. They belong they they involve getting our police and their associates in terms of mental health services uh, to get to know the whole, the population that is living on the streets and try to transition them into um, the right program. So we're about out of time, but I want to give you a chance to to wrap up maybe by saying, well, if we're Longmont and we're not rural, um, and we have these programs that are inadequately funded but working pretty well as far as we can get them to reach. Um, how does that work? Are, we gonna, are, we gonna, are you going to be doing stuff for us? The well, data thing's going to work for us, right? Well, I will definitely be doing stuff. Um, so <laughs> so I, I think this, this is so important. I think that anything that we do at the state level is not going to be enough. And we need to send a strong message to our community that if we value people's lives and we consider um, housing and health care a moral human right, mm -hmm. we need to create a, our own system. Look for other state and federal dollars to flow in to help support that. But we're going to have to go back to our taxpayers as a city, as a county, and say, this is the new plan. Here's where we're going to go. Here's how we're going to build it. And we're going to make sure that we're no longer warehousing people who are struggling with mental health issues in our jails. We're actually going to be providing the right services for them and make them the best people they can be and productive members of society. Thank you, Representative Singer. And this was Capital Conversations. Thanks. Thanks.